experimental angles continue. There is an explanation, but this video is going to be really, really long. So I'm going to tease for Sunday's video, which is going to be like a catch up weekly reads type thing. And I'm going to explain more about why things might look a bit different here. But for now, December wrap up. Hi everyone, Rosie here. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Did I realize as soon as I had said it that I was going to do a January wrap up, not a December wrap up? Yes, but I think it's kind of hilarious, so we're leaving it in. It's time to talk about the books that I read in January. There's actually a lot of them, and I think I have a lot of thoughts, so bear with me if this is a long video. I really hope for the sake of my voice and my editing self that it is not. The first book I read in January was Olga Dies Dreaming, and this is by I forgot to take note of the author, but I think it's Sochil Gonzalez. It will certainly be in the description down below. It is about Olga, a woman in her, I think, mid-30s is what we're led to understand, who is the New York born and bred daughter of hardcore Puerto Rican activists. And she is now a highly successful wedding planner. Her brother is a member of Congress. They're like the classic, wow, success case siblings. But things are a bit more complicated than they seem. And all that starts coming to a head. This was such an incredibly fun book to read. Based on the description of the themes, I was kind of worried it was going to be dark and heavy and like kind of hard to get through. Not at all the case. This was a delight, so much fun, and also so impactful. I don't often have a whole list of things to gush about when I love a book, so I hope you'll allow me to take this opportunity to just like share some stuff I absolutely loved. First of all, it was so fantastic to read a book about a woman in her mid-30s who was a pleasant balance between self-assured, confident adult, but also portrayed as, you know, youthful and adventurous and having fun and living her life and, you know, having sex and being sexually desirable. As someone who is entering that age myself, I'm 27, so like, I'm not young, but I'm also not old, and it felt very reassuring to picture what my 30s could be look like. I need to stop talking before I get confused and also have some of this lemon ginger tea because as you can hear my voice is going, this could be a long video to film. On this next point, I can't speak from personal experience at all, but Olga's world in this overlaps with the world of the ultra wealthy because she's a very successful, very expensive wedding planner. So she's planning all of these weddings for them and like is both inside their world and totally apart from it. And the way those characters and their interactions with the world were written felt incredibly over-exaggerated satire, but also satire that is so depressingly grounded in truth. And on the flip side, Olga's family and the way that her family dynamics with her extended family are written, that felt so incredibly honest and truthful and also kind of comical because reality is funny. Real life is weird. I think it takes a special level of craft to blend the incredibly impactful truth with the comedy in a way that makes it feel even more honest than just the sad emotions. I can't put my finger on why, but this book made me feel like I could be reading a memoir. Not in that I feel like the author was lying to the reader or trying to sell it as truth when it isn't necessarily, but that the characters that were created, the way they related to each other, all of that felt so incredibly tangible. I could believe that it could exist. It has that grain of honesty, even if it's not real. I wish I could put my finger on what exactly it is about the writing that does that, but I don't know. Each individual line felt very straightforward, but like a very straightforward, very good truck. And like, I don't know what it is about this that is having such an impact on me, but it is. Part of that might be that for me, a lot of the ideas that the author is exploring and that the characters are discussing feel very relatable. They feel like thoughts and questions that I have about my own life and about my own interactions with the world, even though my life is very different from Olga's. So I wonder if there's an element of Gonzalez is speaking to something that young people are feeling in the world right now. Overall, I just found this so incredibly wonderful. I absolutely see why it is being heralded as like an amazing debut novel and a book to look out for in 2022 because it was so phenomenal. Oh my goodness, it was 
was so good I forgot to mention. I had this as an ARC from NetGalley, so thank you to NetGalley, and I forgot to write down the publisher. It actually came out at the beginning of January, on January 4th, so if this sounded good, go buy it. It's great. I highly recommend it. The second book I read was Dirk Gently's Solistic Detective Agency by Douglas Adams. I reread this on audio because I realized it had been a very long time since I had read it at all. I was discussing the show with someone recently in a comment, actually, and I realized, wow, I barely remember the book because it had been so long, so I reread it, and it's just really hard to describe. A young computer programmer has his world thrown apart when his boss is murdered and all of the evidence makes it look like he did it, but he didn't. It's wacky, it's ridiculous, it's a hilarious book, and um, I loved it. This next book needs no discussion. It is House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. I started this in December and finished in January, and I was reading it for Sina of Beating Around the Books, House of Leaves read-along. It was so much fun. It was so interesting. I have already talked about House of Leaves three times. There are two spoilery vlogs, which I will link up here, and there is also a non-spoilery discussion reflection video, which I will link up here as well. I read All God's Children Need Traveling Shoes by Maya Angelou fairly early in the month as well. This is her fifth out of seven autobiographies and covers the time that she spends living in Ghana in the 1960s. It really explores, among other things, that experience of being a Black American and returning to Africa and seeing all of the ways that the world could be totally different, but also how that isn't necessarily always what you need. I'm not explaining it well, just read this book because I think she communicates it so perfectly. Then read The Mad Woman of Serrano by Dina Celestio. This is a magical realism novel from Cabo Verde, which I read for the Africa Cup of Nations readathon organized by Mark of Book Time with Elvis. I did a full single book review for this one, so I will link that up here and you can hear about my thoughts there. My next audiobook for the month was The Masked City by Genevieve Cogman. This is the second book in the Invisible Library series, which is a series that I have been wanting to continue for a while. It centers on Irene, a woman who works as a librarian slash agent for this interesting magical library that exists between dimensions. I can't really talk about the plot of this one at all because it's a sequel and it gives stuff away for the previous book, which I did not remember at all, but it was fine. But suffice to say that I really enjoyed it, the story was really really fun, and I'm looking forward to reading the third. I guess I must have never checked, or maybe they've been added recently, but I just found them on Scribd in January in audiobook form, so that's fantastic, and I feel like listening to them is going to be the perfect way to help me fit them into my TBR so that I can actually continue the series instead of procrastinating it for another year. I then finished another book I started in December and been slowly reading Reading. That was Casanova by Lawrence Burgreen. Honestly, in reflection, I don't know why I didn't DNF this book. It was a big, chunky history biography of Casanova, the famous, I think, what did I call him in a previous video? Fuckboy of history. I shouldn't have kept reading, but I kept thinking it would get better. It was the sort of book where I was increasingly frustrated, but I had to see what was going to happen. I had to see if this was going to be turned around because somehow in my head, the author was still going to do something that was going to make it all work, but it just never happened. The introduction, which I read in a try a chapter video back in November, which I'll link up here, I really enjoyed the introduction. It made it sound like it was going to be so much more than just being a playboy around Europe and that his life was going to be super exciting and fascinating. And there were like two or three accounts of stuff like that happening, but mostly it was just the sex. I don't think of myself as a prude. I don't tend to love descriptions of sex in writing because it just... It doesn't translate well in my brain and always seems cringe, but this felt detailed in a gross way. A lot of the sexual encounters that are described in this book, which is heavily based on Casanova's own personal memoirs, a lot of these encounters are things that would be highly, highly taboo and illegal in today's day and age. And that's understandable. It was the past. I get these things. But the author will be presenting all of these descriptions of things that happen. Oh yes, look, Casanova is 
raping another woman. Oh my, yet more rape. This time it's a 13 year old. You get the idea. It's very disconcerting to read that sort of description and that sort of detail for 500 pages with so little contextualization and discussion. All of these accounts seem to me to be presented in just a completely neutral way. No attempt to put it in context of was this pretty standard behavior for the time or was he an outlier? No context about what that means from a modern understanding of consent. I don't know what I would have liked the author to do differently, but the way that this subject was handled in this book did not work for me at all. As I said, I don't know why I kept reading. I don't know why I thought it was going to improve. I should have DNF'd this book. All of this wasn't helped by the fact that the writing style I don't think was very good either. It had a bibliography and it seemed to imply that it had consulted wider scholarship about Casanova's life, of which I imagine there is some, but it felt as if the author was just taking Casanova's own memoir and condensing it and rephrasing it and quoting heavily from it. So it had this weird effect of feeling neither like an engaging narrative story where I wanted to know what happened next, but also it didn't feel like nonfiction and it didn't feel like I could trust what this author was saying. It just did not hit the mark for me. The next book I also have thoughts, but I do not understand them. It is Behold the Dreamers by Mbolo Mbwe. This is another Africa Cup of Nations read. I picked it for the country of Cameroon because it's about Cameroonian immigrants and is by a woman who is Cameroonian American. I don't know how to feel about this book. The characters felt either realer than real, so full of truth and impactful, or incredibly stereotypical. And I couldn't tell which I thought. It felt like reading a 400 page novel that was the equivalent of those optical illusions where if you look at it one way, it's an old woman in a hat and at the other way, it's a young woman sort of thing. Am I reading some beautifully written, emotionally impactful, yet highly readable prose? Or is this garbage that's just like hitting all of the easy pleasure buttons in my brain for some reason? Another aspect that I'm just confused by is how the Wall Street exec characters and their families are portrayed, especially the family that we center on because we get to know one family particularly well. It felt very much like they were trying to really humanize that character. You know, he's an exec at Lehman Brothers who's been like involved in all of the scummy mortgage repackaging shit that they were doing back in the early 2000s before the Great Recession. And then in sort of the months before the Great Recession actually happens, we see him develop like a conscious and like start to feel like, I don't know guys, I think we should back out. I think we need to come clean. I think we need to like try and fix this. And everyone around him's going like, no nah, man, it's fine. It's gonna be gravy train forever. I don't know if that's an interesting perspective on this situation or if it's just like capitalism propaganda? I shouldn't be this confused about this book and yet I really am. The one thing I do know is that if I have complained a lot lately about books not making me feel anything, which I have, well maybe I should be grateful for that because this book made me feel so much and I was not on board for it. I then read a sort of long essay really, it was a transcript of a speech and it was called Women's Liberation and the African Freedom Struggle by Thomas Sankara. The author was the head of a revolutionary government in Burkina Faso in the 19th 80s and this book slash essay is essentially a transcription of a speech he gave on International Women's Day or something like that. It's all about how there is no true freedom from imperialist and capitalist exploitation as long as women are still treated as second-class citizens within a society. And overall, oh my goodness, this was so compelling for something from the 80s. Very solid. I'm not a scholar on this. I'm not an expert. And I haven't read a lot of this sort of work, but very pleasantly surprised. There's definitely some points that we could argue and like things where I feel like I could have a critique or a response, but like overall, wow, fascinating. In 2022, Katja of Read, Write, Create is hosting a series of intro to Terry Pratchett read-alongs, which I am co-hosting with her along with Scott of Gunpowder Fiction and Plot. 
and I think Kevia said so Kevia is joining us for most of them. I'm not positive, but I think so, which will be so much fun. In January, we read Equal Rights by Terry Pratchett. This is the story of Escarina Smith, who is the eighth son of an eighth son, just after her birth is given a staff by a wizard who was about to die. Unfortunately, because the wizard was foolish and didn't listen to the midwife, Escarina is also a girl, and girls can't be wizards. Girls are witches. Wizards are men. This is how it always is. This is how the witches and the wizards would both like to keep it but they're gonna have to work something out because Esk's powers are growing. This was so much fun. I will link in the description to our live show wrap up, which was so fabulous. And I'm so looking forward to March when we are going to be reading Mort. My final book for the Africa Cup of Nations readathon was The Wife's Tale by Ida and Amariam. I probably would have benefited from reading a quick timeline of 20th century Ethiopian history before this because it's both a memoir and a history of Ethiopia but from this one woman's perspective. It is the story of Yeta Megnu, who is the author's grandmother, who was born in around 1915, I think, in Ethiopia. You cannot tell the story of this woman's life without getting very into the story of Ethiopia's history in the 20th century. It's an incredibly personal account of a woman who seems simultaneously like every other woman and also does some extraordinary things and has an extraordinary life. If I talked earlier about Olga Dies Dreaming as a novel that feels like it could be a memoir slash autobiography, well this is a memoir slash autobiography slash biography that feels like it could be a beautifully crafted novel. Absolutely adored the prose. I thought it was so compellingly written. The amount of detail and emotion and everything that is communicated on every page and how thoroughly transported I felt into this world that is completely different from anything I have ever known. Just phenomenally done. I will say there are some strong trigger warnings for some dramatic awful things in this book so make sure you check that out before you read it and feel free to message me if you want any more detail about that. Amazing book. Definitely recommend. My final audiobook of the month was going to be A Coin for the Ferryman by Megan Edwards. This is about time travel and a plan to bring Julius Caesar into the 90s and then while he's there he gets kidnapped or something. I'm not actually totally sure because I DNF'd it. This was an arc from NetGalley so thank you to NetGalley and whoever the publisher is. I couldn't tell with this book if the narrator didn't work or the text didn't work or both. The narrator felt very out of place and very unpleasant to me. This was not a narrator that I enjoyed. I think the writing played up on the way a lot of this book was written combined with the narrator's voice just gave me the most male gazy, very slimy feeling. And I know that's a weird way to describe it, but that's the best I can come up with. One of the heavy components of this was just the utter fixation by the text itself with how the young female characters looked even when it totally makes sense for these characters to be doing with it and it's probably absolutely reflecting the reality of how people in certain situations think, that's just not a worldview I feel the need to experience at all. I can't comment about the plot and the pacing that much because I made it to 30% of the way through this book and basically nothing had happened. It had been four hours of audiobook of just meeting people and getting way too much backstory about them. That could have been okay, except I didn't care about a single one of these people. I don't need the characters in a book to make me feel like I love them like my own family or anything like that. Kind of basic characters would have been fine if this was the sci-fi adventure romp that the description made it sound like. But if you're going to have four hours of audiobook that is nothing but meeting people, watching people having administrative meetings and seeing two middle-aged adults fall in insta-love for some reason with no explanation whatsoever, just like, hi, I met you, you have a Nobel Prize, okay, I'm in love with you. Why? If you're gonna make me sit through that, I'd better care about the characters because you're not giving me any plot. I don't want to rant about this book anymore because, as I said, I don't have that much more to say, but this sounded like it was gonna be phenomenal and I 
hated it. So I cleansed my palette with Jingo by Terry Pratchett. This is a City Watch novel. I'll put the numbers up on the screen or something because I forgot to take note of them. An island appears out of nowhere in the sea between Ankh-Morpork and Clatch, and the powder keg of nationalism and political tension begins to explode and war is on the horizon. As with all of the City Watch books, there's heavy themes of what does it mean to be a policeman? What does it mean to be a protector of the people? But as we see increasingly in the City Watch books, there are also big themes of politics with a capital P and discussion of big crimes and little crimes and who is policed and who gets away with things. I loved this one. It was fantastic. Nothing more to say. When I finished Casanova, I picked up Under the Black Flag by David Cordingly. This was the book that was picked for me by round five, I think, of the booktube spin. Whatever the most recent round is. I think it was five. And I thought it would be perfect to read before bed. Some nice non-fiction. In theory, it's looking at how we arrived at the modern image of a pirate. What you see when you close your eyes and go pirate. How did we get there? Where did these traits come from? And how accurately does that reflect the reality of life for pirates in the sort of golden age of piracy in the 1600s and the 17, early, very early 1700s? That sounds amazing. That sounds like a book that I am going to be all about. Just didn't really come together for me. I found it quite disjointed. I found that a lot of the information was presented in a way where there was simultaneously these big jumps where I'm going, wait, why is this right after this? How are these tied? You're just ending one paragraph and starting another, but I don't see the linkage at all. And also involved a lot of repetition. So it'd be like, okay, yeah, you've talked about this aspect like five times. You didn't there didn't seem to be any organizational structure at all. And I feel a bit hypocritical because there's other books that I've read and very much enjoyed and recommended that are kind of similar in that respect. I think what sets those books apart and makes me not a hypocrite here is that the books I love with this sort of lack of structure, the prose and the writing are the reason for reading the book, not the information. I really enjoyed The Inconvenient Indian by Thomas King because of Thomas King's writing, not because of the information that he was presenting and the order he presented it in. Likewise, if you're just presenting information and I'm just trying to get information, I don't mind if your writing is not phenomenally funny and insightful and impactful if the information is organized in a way that is conducive to getting it. But you need one, and this didn't have either for me. I think it also showed that it was written in the 90s. It came out in 1995 and a lot of the language, I know that things are not necessarily that much better now and I know that there's still a lot of issues with this, but a lot of the language it was using regarding people of color and indigenous people just felt like it would have been worded differently now and some of the way that the themes and the topics were presented, especially regarding colonizing nations and their interactions with indigenous people in the Caribbean and stuff, that, yeah, felt like it could have been different, could have been handled better. Hopefully the fact that I'm noticing that means that we have improved somewhat. Those were all of the books that I expected to read in January and that's already a lot, but January went kind of differently to how we were expecting. Again, see the video coming on Sunday about what's going on in my life and stuff, but towards the middle of the month my partner got sick with COVID, so we were in lockdown and I was reading a lot more, and then in the last week of the month I got sick with COVID and was not working because all I could do was lie on the couch and sometimes not be asleep. So I was reading a lot, I finished my books, and I wanted to just like read whatever would make me feel good. It's no time to try and slog through something you're not excited about. Luckily for me, like the day after I got sick, The Lady with the Gun Asked the Questions by Carrie Greenwood got approved for me on NetGalley, which was very exciting. This is a collection of Franny Fisher's short stories, mostly older ones, but some new ones as well that haven't been published before. I think it came out in Australia and the, probably the UK last year, but it's being released in North America in, I want to say it's like May of 2022. Thank you to NetGalley and Poison Pen Press. I didn't think I was going to get an e-arc of this and I was kind of bummed about it, honestly, because I was so excited to read it and so like I need to read this right away. Over a month after I requested it, it was approved and what perfect timing because I just finished my TBR, was in need of some comfort reading. I had only read a few of the older short stories so that was so much fun for me to explore and to discover. And especially to read the short stories that got turned into episodes of the show so you can see some of the similarities, some of the basis, but also how things got changed. 
Mm, so much fun. I think I would put this collection and the stories within it at better than the most recent few novels, but not as good as the best of the novels. Lately I've found the Franny Fisher novels in the last two or three sort of thing, I think, have been getting a bit all of the things all of the time, way too much is being dragged into this and it's not quite working anymore. So the brevity of the short stories prevents that. It has to be much more focused. But because they're so short, there's not as much room for like clue detecting and solving things and stuff. So I feel like it's a lot more Franny looks at a situation, notices three clues, and then shares them. So that's not quite as fun as the really good full novels. If you don't like the world building aspect in the Friday stories, I don't think this collection is for you. If you're here for just the detective stuff, maybe skip this one. But if you like everything about the writing, the characters, the way things are described, I think this is a super fun peek into Franny's world and I would highly recommend picking it up. My next utter treat myself pick was This Is Going To Hurt by Adam Kay. This is an account of Kay's early career as a doctor in the UK and highlights a lot of the ways that the healthcare system is just not being well run and the problems that that is causing. But also it's incredibly funny. It has so many funny stories in it. I've been like trickle convinced to read this since I joined booktube. I keep seeing people talk about it and I keep being like wow that sounds great. And then in January I put together a nonfiction for beginners recommendation video that so many people contributed to so make sure you watch that if you haven't seen it already. One of those people was Charlotte of Coiny Reads and she recommended this book and hearing her talk about it I was just like I need to read this. I need to read this right now. And I absolutely did. It is this combination of humor and social commentary that I don't know how to pinpoint what aspects about it I love, but I just do. It is all my brain wants to consume these days. And even though it is very, very focused on the UK and the NHS there, I think it has some really, really relevant commentary to make on the current situation with Canada's healthcare system. Just read it because it's an enjoyable book, not just because it has important messages. Like, it does, but just read this because it's really good. And also remember that when universal healthcare, whatever you want to call it, is being poorly managed, the solution is to manage it better, not let politicians convince you that a private system would fix the problems, because it wouldn't. In search of another fun, quick hit of joy, I read The Pineapples of Wrath by Kathleen. This is a graphic novel murder mystery and it is set in a small town in Quebec. Follows the mystery of an elderly former limbo champion who dies alone in her apartment. The police put it down to a pina colada overdose, but her neighbor, who is obsessed with cozy murder mysteries, doesn't think that that is all there is to it and decides to investigate the crime. This is the type of art and type of story that I love for lying on the couch. There is something so delightful about a whimsical graphic novel murder mystery with some humor, ideally set in a small town in rural Canada apparently, but like, I just love them. So if you have any recommendations, let me know. I will say in this case, some of the way some of the characters were drawn and some of the uses of Hawaiian culture in the story, I don't know if I should find them racist or not. They're the sort of thing where I'm reading them going, is this kind of really kind of racist? Or am I just looking for things that aren't there? And I don't know. And on that topic, I don't think I'm the person to make the calls. If any of you have read it or have any thoughts or have seen people talk about it, let me know because I'd be curious to know what other people think. And the final book that I actually finished in January. I have a couple more that are still on the go, but I'm not going to finish them in the next two days. So we don't need to talk about them now. The last book I actually finished was The Appeal by Janice Hallett. This is the investigation of a murder among an amateur theater troupe, but it's told via mixed media. The story is framed as we're following two, I think like trainee lawyers or whatever they call them in the UK, who are reviewing documents to help prepare an appeal for this case. So for example, you might read a whole section that are emails back and forth between the members of the theater troupe in the weeks leading up to this murder. And then you get like a section of IM messages between these two students who are like discussing what they've read. I saw Paper Not Books talk about it at the end of December, beginning of January. I can't remember when, but I will link her channel down below because it's really good. And immediately I was like, oh my god, that sounds 
amazing. I need to read this book. I wanted to treat myself while I was sick. And lucky me, it came out in Canada on January 25th. So I read it immediately and it was so much fun. I was instantly hooked and I stayed hooked all the way through. I was so immersed and like in the zone with this book. It was phenomenal. I was also really, really impressed and like enjoyed how amazing text messages and emails work to build character. Like you could start to know these people so well based on how they sent their emails. And I'd never considered that before, but like, yes, and it worked perfectly. That does make it really hard to pin down a sense of what's actually happening because we're only ever seeing sort of various sides and people's perspectives, but that's so much fun. I dabbled briefly in community theater as a child and as a teenager, and I have to say the atmosphere and the way the relationships within this theater troupe worked, all of them felt so spot on, so accurate, just like, oh wow, yes, this feels so real. Which is good because this book, the mystery totally hinges on the interpersonal relationships and characters and what people do and how people interact with each other. That is all of it. This is not a book that's about dusting for fingerprints and that sort of thing. It's about analyzing the interpersonal relationships to solve the murder. And in order to do that, the reader is just completely immersed in the tangled web that is this community. I think this would be such a fun book to read if you wanted to do one of those like projects or videos or whatever you want to call it, whether you record it or not, but just like read a mystery book and try and solve the mystery as you're reading. I think this book would be perfect for that because we have information at the same rate as the solver, the two students who are solving it. Everything they know, we know. That's not all the information that is available. Stuff does get revealed throughout the book, of course, but I don't know. I think that could be really fun. I didn't do that. I just like lay on the couch and read it, but wow, no matter how you read it, this was great. I loved it. And if you can recommend any other similar mystery books, please let me know down below because I need to read more. So those are all the books that I read in January. I have been filming for so long and I finished just in time because I just finished my lemon ginger tea. Good timing there. I'm gonna stop talking because I'm losing the ability to, but let me know down below. What did you read in January? How did you feel about it? And have you read any of these books? And if you like this video, please give it a like down below. If you'd like to see more of my videos, please hit subscribe and thank you for watching.